White Boy Rick uh, was uh, a piece that we published last, what was that, September, October? Late September, yeah. September. Um, and at the Atavist, we only do 12 stories a year. So uh, what stories we pick, what stories we publish, the time we spend on them is very important to us. So um, I thought we'd maybe just start by talking a little bit about how you came across the story uh, before we get into sort of like why we, why we ended up publishing it. Yeah. Um, so I, I had a tipster on this story <laughs> in a way. Um, it was um, the wife of a journalist friend is an attorney and she works on a lot of issues surrounding the drug war and juvenile detention and things like that. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the website The Fix, which is about addiction and drugs. They had run a short piece about Rick, Rick Wershey, AKA White Boy Rick. And it was written by another prisoner, another drug war prisoner. And so it was, it was really like a free White Boy Rick um, editorial. And um, it sort of whetted my appetite to find out more um, I didn't necessarily believe everything in it. It seemed a little credulous about Rick's claims. Um, so that was really the start of it was like, uh, like Ben was talking about earlier, like, can we show this is true? Is this true? Yeah, and that's a, I feel like that's a common, a common instance with, with magazine stories is they, they often start with these sort of like smaller stories, whether it's newspaper or wire story or nowadays blogs things that pop up on Twitter where a magazine writer will so, sort of say, well, okay, yeah, someone's, this is out there. This is not, it's not uncovering something for the first time, but has it been told in the right way? Either like, is this true? Can I delve into it? Or has anyone really looked at these characters and really like blown them out? But one interesting thing uh, I know from reading the, I went back and looked at the pitch for the story was that you actually did a good deal of reporting. I mean, before we saw anything, you had already, your pitch included FBI sources that you'd talk to and things like that. So how long was that process? I forgot that. <laughs> um, Wait, did yeah. you, is that true? Did no, you, you it, it, is, <laughs> it is true. I mean, in the end, I think it was like around 18 months that I was working on the story or close to that. And, but, you know, off and on, but um, it was a long process. And so I, I had, I did do some reporting because I felt like it was the kind of story that you had to do a little homework uh, <laughs> because if it wasn't true, there's no story. So, you know, it, it was because I really didn't, frankly, trust this piece that was basically, just to give you an idea of the, like, public knowledge of White Boy Rick, before I wrote the story, it was sort of everyone in Detroit knows who he is. He's, he was a kind of, at least of a certain age, like he was a bold face name in the 80s. He was like 14, 15, 16 years old and dealing a lot of cocaine and like living in an entirely black subculture, um, you know, in a city that's very racially divided. So he was, he was a thing. He was on the nightly news a lot. Um, People from Detroit of that era know that name. They totally know him. He's in a Kid Rock song and stuff like this. So, so um, that was known, but then he'd kind of faded and then there was this, it only came out years later, he started making allegations that he had also been an informant. And so those allegations were in that story on the fix, but they weren't really substantiated at all. Um, and no one had really substantiated. And I think it had been reported that he had made these claims, but that, that was sort of, it just died there. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of like the ball I was picking up. And also the fact that it hadn't, it was a sort of lucky find in that it hadn't been a national story yet, even the white boy Rick part, you know, without the informing, like it just one of those stories that stayed in Michigan, basically. So this, this, uh, this pitch came into us and actually came into Charlie Homans, who, uh, full disclosure, is the actual editor of this story. So I didn't edit this story, I top edited the story, uh, unlike the uh, previous editors this morning, along with Chris's empty chair. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really move the words around in this story very much. Uh, or if I did, it was like laundered through uh, Charlie, our editor at the time. So he probably doesn't even know which things I, I wanted to change. So this pitch came in to, to Charlie Homans and uh, I remember him just saying to me, oh, Evan Hughes uh, has a story about white boy Rick. And like, it's not like you could sell a story just on uh, the name of it, 
but there are certain stories that like that just stuck in my head. Like even before reading the pitch, I just thought like white boy Rick. Like it's 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 just like a captivating like who is this? Why is he called that? There's this racial element wrapped up in the whole thing like from the very beginning. Um, but when the actual pitch came in, when the pitch was forwarded on to me and we sat down to talk about it, I mean, this was like uh, an editor's dream pitch, basically. I mean, we get a lot of pitches that are like uh, a paragraph, uh, an idea, those can, those can be assigned. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that a story can be assigned by having lunch with an editor and saying, I wanna do this, depending on your relationship. And this was like a real pitch, like a model pitch. Like, here's what the story's gonna be. Uh, I've talked to these sources that indicate that this stuff might be true. I've, I've got new information I'm uncovering. Here's the arc of the story. It had a scene in it at the very beginning. It was only maybe a page and a half, probably, uh, total. Um, but I would say even with that, um, because we're so limited in the number of stories we do and because like a story not working out for us is a really bad thing because we're actually very small, um, we, even, we went back on it and said, uh, yeah, but what about this and what about that? Like we had a round even on the pitch to try to figure out, okay, like can we go a little deeper before we say like, yes, this is worth uh, investing the time. Mm -hmm. and, and we had a kind of, and we do that often with writers where there's a sort of interaction that happens even before a story is assigned. And that can be, I think, frustrating for writers, uh, especially writers who don't do a lot of this kind of work because you waste a lot of time. I mean, when you're developing pitches and sending them in, like you might develop a story that nobody wants. You might develop a story that someone makes you do a lot of work on and then doesn't assign. Um, but in the end, uh, for us at least, it sort of reduces the chance that he's gonna go out for four months or six months to report this story and then come back and say like, well, it's not quite what we thought. I got nothing. <laughs> yeah. And then it gets killed and then everyone's, uh, everyone's wasted time and, and right. money on it. So. Right. And I remember like one of one of um, the pieces of feedback that I got, and I always assumed it was Charlie, so I'm going to say it was Charlie. But Probably maybe Charlie. It was if you. it was smart, it was Charlie. <laughs> no, but I, at the beginning, I remember. I think actually the 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 way that I pitched it. I mean, I I sort of knew you. Maybe we'd met, but I we, we were part of a, a group of Evans on Twitter <laughs> that sometimes just tweeted each other about like Evans in the news. Right. That's, how, that's the only way I knew you. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I sort of pitched it like over a drink with Charlie. And then one of his pieces of feedback really early on was like, I'm, I'm not so interested in free white boy Rick as the like driving thing of the story. In other words, that it would have, it would be an element of advocacy. Like th this guy has been screwed. And I think he has been screwed. <laughs> and I think if you read the story, a lot of people come to that place but we didn't want it to be, he didn't want it to be that. And I felt like that was a great sign for me because it was like, you don't want to be in that position of like apologizing for the guy's crimes, you know? And he's not the complete innocent who's been caught up in the system. You know, um, Pam Koloff and David Grant have written stories about people who were innocent and probably innocent and put to death. You know, you, th this isn't that. Um, so we felt like it was more um, narrative and it was more balanced and it had to be very uh, skeptical of, of Rick's claims, you know, and really dig into those. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that it, it's more narrative because uh, one of the things that for our purposes, like we're only doing stories that are narrative. That's our, that's our purview. That's what we say we do, we do. Uh, there's lots of ways that we describe it, like cinematic storytelling, narrative storytelling. Uh, but what you find when writers are pitching you a lot of stories is they have very divergent views of what narrative means. Uh, so for, for people who write a certain type of story, uh, a narrative, uh, they might think of a narrative as a story that's about a topic, but it is then illustrated by anecdotes. Uh, so in this case, that would be sort of like, you know, White Boy Rick is the only remaining juvenile life I mean, he was sentenced to life in prison as a juvenile. Supreme Court later declared that you could no longer do that. Most of them were released, and he's like the last one. So that in and of itself could be a story, a magazine story. It's a great topic. Juveniles incarcerated for too long, trials of the drug war, like that sort of thing. Uh, and he could illustrate that point. But we're taking it from the other way around, which is, is this person and his story itself complex and interesting and contains surprise and tension that we can build into a narrative? And if it happens to illustrate 
something about juveniles in the justice system, that's fantastic, but it has to start with the narrative. It has to start with a story that you're gonna tell that if you stop telling it in the middle, everyone would say, uh, wait, how does that end? Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that's a sort of key part in assigning it. And when we went through a couple of rounds of the pitches, uh, it was clear that it had that. You know? Now there's still a long way between that and, uh, and delivering the story. Uh, and you, I mean, how long was the reporting process on this story? Yeah, it was, so it was like almost, almost a year and a half. And it was also like a lot of that was um, going back and forth on drafts. I mean, um, I think I turned in the first one. Yeah, it was like two days after New Year's. So it was published like 10 months later or, or nine months later. Oh, right. And, and um, it, Chris Jones was talking earlier about how you have that horrible moment of tension after you file the story and you wait for like the first word. God bless him, Charlie wrote back to me in like a day and this thing was like 24,000 words. And he was like, so this is awesome. And which was a great way to start, but you know, it was, you knew you were gonna get the but, but, but it was like, we've got something here. Um, and, and, and the but lasted 10 months. <laughs> that is a real editor but, trick. Like every editor writes like, this is great. Like every memo starts up, this is gonna be great. Right. And this is great. Right. And then it's like, there's like three pages of red yeah. uh, r that follows after that. Yeah, and in fact, I think he got, in his first edit, he got like three quarters of the way through and he's like, so the rest of this really is not gonna fly. <laughs> and it was like, okay. So we're, we're pretty early on now. Well, one thing that's interesting, I was looking back at the initial edit of this uh, story that, again, was done by, by Charlie, and uh, you know, part of what we were here to talk about is sort of like what's different between what we do, we're digital only, mm -hmm. uh, we focus a lot on sort of design, we sometimes do stuff that's very heavily multimedia, you know, what's different between that and doing uh, a story for a magazine, a regular print magazine, let's say. Um, and the answer is that it's, it's not substantially different in terms of the process of creating the story. But one thing that is different, uh, especially in contrast to uh, what, what they were describing this morning, is that when this story came in, it was about 14,000 words. And one of the first things that was in the edit was more, like oh, no yeah. more, yeah. which is uh, not something that typically happens in a magazine. So because we have, uh, we don't have unlimited space because we do try to put like a high-end limit of 30,000 words on our stories. Um, because we're trying to sort of live a little bit below the book realm. Um, but we do, we struggle with the inverse problem that most magazines struggle for. So you turn in a story for a magazine, the editor says, okay, I got 5,000 words, or I've got 6,000 words, and then a page drops out, and now I gotta kill, 5, 000, kill a thousand words. Uh, we struggle with the opposite problem, which is uh, we have all this space. So uh, how are we gonna manage that? How are we gonna edit this story? And one thing that I realized very early on is that one of the tools that editors use that is their most valuable tool that we don't have is, sorry, we don't have any space. <laughs> and so the editing process becomes, uh, can become much more fraught uh, because you can't use that as, as the reason why you're cutting something out. You have to literally say like, this slows the story down. This makes the story boring. Uh, I think this is too much on this tangent. And uh, the interesting thing in going back and looking at the, the process of White Boy Rick was uh, how much it changed in structure uh, and how that evolved. So uh, they're sort of like going back and forth over months and months, and you could see the sort of conversations back and forth, uh, and eventually they sort of settle on this very, uh, what to me was an interesting and, and somewhat innovative structure of almost telling the story of White Boy Rick's life and then in the second major section, going back and telling that story again, but from a, a slightly different angle. So in the first one, you, you have a hint that he might be an informant, but you're really reading about his life as a drug dealer as it's known to people in Detroit. And then that's all undone in the second section. You're actually learning about, oh, this is the real, this is the story uh, as the reporter has dug in and found the story that has been told. And then the third one sort of takes it forward from there. But I'm curious how, how painful that process was uh, for you. It looks all, it looks all good, uh, you know, reading the notes. Uh, to, to be honest, no angry to notes. be honest, intensely painful. <laughs> like, I wanted to wring Charlie's neck many times. Um, but no, I mean. Well, it's great to be but, the person who didn't actually edit the story. <laughs> but I, I, um, 
I think, uh, you know, Charlie was very demanding, but I'm also demanding, I mean, of myself, but also I think, you know, naturally that comes on to Charlie too. So, so we had long phone conversations and at, actually piece of advice that I feel like I've learned is like the phone, the old fashioned phone can be really good. Like we talked through a lot of things um, and got through, you know, and, and had some candor that, you know, we might have edited out on emails and got through a lot of material in a, in a 45 minute call. But so we had long calls and, and one thing we talked about from the very beginning was like structure. So we spent a lot of time like worrying about that. And there, um, you know, the story is long. So, um, and the atavist does this thing, which I think works really well of like chapters. And so they're, it, it's broken up, they're each like 1500 words or so. And so it's like, um, I almost think of the first chapter as like the lead of the story, even though it's 1500 words, which is a long lead. And then the second chapter is kind of like a nutcraft sort of scenario. It tells you what the story is. Uh, and then third, you sort of start telling it, you know. Um, and, but, you know, the first, I think the first attempt it w was a kind of sexy anecdotal, like cloak and dagger thing as the first chapter, but it comes like rather late in the saga of White Boy Rick. And it's kind of, actually, he's already in prison, but he helped um, like incarcerate a dozen cops. And, that, and there was a very elaborate sting that caught these guys. And it was like, so it was kind of a grabby opening, but I felt like, oh, that sort of screws up this thing where I was gonna delay the introduction of the fact that he's an informant. And it also is actually a little bit tangential to the story. Um, so we kind of went back to the drawing board. Well, it's also, I mean, I think editors have these uh, different, different tricks that they fall back on uh, depending on where they came from and what their experience is. And like one of mine is sort of like uh, chronology based that like generally when you're telling this type of story, a narrative story in the way we think of a narrative story, like chronology is mostly your friend. Um, that's how you tell a story to someone in person uh, you say this happened and this happened and this happened. You don't generally say uh, this happened and then like now I'm going to go back and now I'm going to describe this and then I'm going to go back again. But uh, I think we would all know if you love this kind of work that you've read stories that play with chronology and when they do it right, they're incredible. But you sort of have to get the chronology down first and make sure that you're telling the story in a way that's intelligible. And I think in this story, uh, looking at the early drafts, there were sort of uh, it was trying to play with chronology in two ways, like the way that I described the structure ended up, and then plus, well, let's take this really dramatic seed from the end and put it at the beginning. But there's a lot of stuff to explain. Yeah. Uh, you haven't even met the characters yet. And uh, one thing that we often do is we sort of, we don't quite storyboard it, but, uh, but we really think of it like, like a movie. Like, what if you were going to portray this thing visually? What would you show first? You would want to show something dramatic first. You'd want to hook people in to the characters and give them some insight into the characters, but pretty soon you'd want to back up and say, okay, but we're gonna sit try to situate you in this thing so that you understand uh, what it is you're reading. And there's a lot of temptation, again, like the freewheeling world of, of like digital journalism where uh, you kind of do whatever you want. Like we're not constrained by legacies of what a particular magazine has done before, but there's a lot of problems with that because you can get gimmicky, you can make things long for the sake of being long, you can just pack them full of extra stuff that came in the reporting. So those are the things that, uh, that take many months, I think, to hash out. Yeah, uh, and, and just to, and touching on like the, the sort of topic of this particular panel, I think that w um, one of the things that Charlie did really well is push the story in that narrative direction of like, we need to know about these characters before they do something and to make things more visual. Like I was doing all of these interviews and I get very focused on like getting the answers that I want. Um, and, and the story, I felt like it had to be strong in terms of corroboration. So there was a lot of that, of like three people in the room describing something, but that, you know, slowed things down. And Charlie was like, we trust you, man. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it you know, 
as much as possible, it's kind of built on a series of scenes. And this was like a little bit new to me because, um, or like uncomfortable to me, I guess, because like I actually like, so I tried to have a career in the movie business. Like, when, you may not even know this, no. but like, um, <laughs> when, when I was like just, now we're getting to the, to the Chris Jones part of this. this <laughs> like, thing. just when I was like just out of college, I wanted to be a director and, and like, I totally like turned against it in bitterness. So it's like, it's like, I have contempt for movies, really. <laughs> and uh, don't tell Universal Studios that. <laughs> Do you have a bad experience? Uh, no, well, yes. What's I mean, not like experience? there wasn't like a scarring thing, but it was like it was not happening for me, and that probably made me bitter. But, but I don't know. And then like a lot of like my friends, you know, had things that were sort of dumbed down as they became movies and stuff, and I. I thought, um, I began to feel like, oh, I'm really more of a, like a books and a magazine person. So, um, but one of the things that I kind of had to acknowledge in doing the story was like, um, we are visual people. And like, if you, if you use the tools of the visual and, and even all the senses um, and kind of put people there in the story, that's when they're like turning the pages and want to know what, well, turning the pages, scrolling. <laughs> Scro uh, <laughs> flicking their finger yeah. one inch over and over And that's when they, they want to know what happens next. I remember like Ira Glass has talked about this, that radio is actually a vis visual medium. Like you want to like have people imagine it. So there was, Charlie was really good in kind of moving us to that. And then for, uh, in terms of like producing the story, I mean, the other thing that's different uh, for us is that we're digital only. So, you know, we're, when we're th we think about the design of the story, uh, all we're thinking about is what it looks like on the web or what it looks like in our app. And so uh, our producer and designer who are working on the story are pretty early on trying to conceive, okay, what's the experience of this thing gonna be online? Uh, including is there, is there audio, is there video? How do those get incorporated? Um, in this particular piece, uh, there wasn't uh, there wasn't a sort of like big media element that we wanted to include in it. Partly because uh, the story is eighteen thousand words, uh, it's it's fairly complex. I mean, it's an easy read and uh, it really like pulls you along. But it's also like you might not want to stop in the middle of it and watch like a series video or you know get pulled out by like an interactive element or something like that. So. We did, we did a couple things just, uh, just to kind of give you this like other sensory perception of who this guy was. And one of which was that we, I mean, there's obviously like big photos on it, but it's very spare uh, in terms of the design. Uh, and there's a little bit of, of audio in it. So there's a little bit of audio of uh, Evan talking to Rick uh, in prison, um, which partly is uh, to just kind of like uh, show your work a little bit. I mean, that's, that can kind of be a bad phrase in this type of work that like you don't want to keep putting in like, I reported this, I reported that to prove that you did it all. Like you really just want to tell the story. Um, but there's an element of sort of like letting the reader know that like this is told from a perspective deep inside the story. And so giving them a little sense of like, oh, I've heard this guy's voice. Like I can, I can situate this guy in my mind. And then there's another one in here that's a, that's a surveillance uh, tape from uh, the later case, uh, like Sting Operation, where they had taped uh, basically these cops were running a protection racket, if you haven't read the story. Um, so that's in there, along with a lot of the sort of legal documents uh, are sort of scattered throughout, which again, uh, in the spirit of, of good design, hopefully uh, doesn't take away from the story it actually like gives you this richer experience because you're sort of like you read a section and you're you're reading about oh uh, I'm trying to think of what the uh, example was there was like there's something there's a couple things in there that are just very hard to believe I mean even in the story itself it describes how like some of these things are very hard to believe that they happened uh, oh one of them is that the FBI paid for Vegas. White Boy Rick to travel to Las Vegas to a, a fight uh, a Marvin Hagler fight uh, with these drug dealers. And you kind of think like, ah, oh, the FBI didn't pay for it. He was 15, it. yeah. Yeah, he was 15 years old, so working as an informant. And so you read it, and then right after that is the document, the like redacted document that basically is the approval of the expenses for them to pay white boy Rick, 15 years old, to go to Las Vegas. So, you know, like I said, 
none of what I'm describing here is particularly different from what a magazine designer would do with any story. You know, that's the, that's the role of a good designer is to take the words, uh, work with the photo editors, find the visuals, and then uh, try to bring it to life uh, without distracting the reader's attention uh, from it, uh, except that like Wired in the 1990s uh, <laughs> was more about design for design's sake. Um, the other aspect that I wanted to just bring up, because I was curious, I don't actually know if you've gotten, uh, I know you've been on like Detroit local news and stuff uh, about this, but this guy, I mean, one of the things that this story had, uh, it sort of had everything for us. It had this incredible narrative. It had uh, some larger issues about the drug war, as I described before. Um, and it also had uh, not quite breaking news in some sense, but it basically, uh, what Evan was able to do was like corroborate uh, stories that have been going around Detroit for many years about uh, this guy, the police chief, uh, essentially covering up, helping cover up a murder. Um, and I'm curious, uh, first of all, I'm curious if anyone recognizes this guy if they haven't read the story. If you've read the story, it's sort of like a spoiler, but he actually played the Detroit cop in Beverly Hills Cop. Have you ever seen that? He like plays himself he's, kind he's of. Axel's boss. Yeah. Uh, back in Detroit. Yeah. yeah so he, he was kind of like a local hero in Detroit already by this time. So because he'd been on Beverly Hills Cop and then he's in two and three. And, and, and it, that was only a year before this all happened. And there was a shooting of a 13 year old kid. And there was a gang called the Curry Brothers. And they were responsible for this shooting. Uh, and it got to the point where everyone kind of knew that. Um, but they were never even charged with it. And, um, it, you know, the story that I had heard was that, like, he had taken $10,000 to kind of redirect the investigation elsewhere, and uh, which was hard to believe. <laughs> but it became a little more credible as I learned that everyone in Detroit was corrupt at this time. Um, uh, but it still seemed like, like, I remember trying to illustrate this to Charlie. I was like, do you realize he's like a hero in Detroit? He's still, to this day, kind of a hero in Detroit. He almost, he he almost took, won the mayor's, mayoral election. He almost won point. the mayoral election. He lost to Kwame Kilpatrick, so you can see that. <laughs> um, but, um, but he, you know, he took like this shoebox full of money. To, and it's all complicated because Johnny Curry's wife was the niece of the mayor. So that was part of it. Like, um, so it, it was all quite political. but. Um, there was, I never did reach him. I tried <laughs> many times, um, but his, his sort of right hand man, uh, I finally did reach like in the last week before, um, we published the story and he told me it happened. Yeah. Like, and that was, I mean, that was a pretty dramatic moment in our office because I mean, we were going to publish the story either way. We were, we were set to go with it, but. Um, it did have this allegation in it, uh, which uh, is pretty inflammatory. I mean, basically you're saying this guy uh, covered up a murder. Um, he would not respond. He's like rumored to be maybe incapacitated. Uh, either way, he would not respond to inquiries. And so we were sort of left with this question of, okay, you have a, you have a subject who's not gonna provide any response. We have some corroboration, but not a lot. And then uh, I feel like, yeah, a week before Mm -hmm. uh, you you heard from this guy who basically said like yeah I was there I <laughs> yeah I saw him take the money yeah and I was a little worried about him too though it wasn't like an instant eureka moment because he um, he went to jail <laughs> the other guy um, in that protection racket thing and he was really bitter at Gil Hill this is Gil Hill for kind of distancing himself from that even though he had knowledge of that too. Um, so I didn't want him to just be telling me anything that would bury Gil Hill. Okay. <laughs> like I felt like I had to be careful and he was giving a lot of detail that I was a little bit wary of. Like, you know, his story kept getting a little bit embellished. So I was like, all right, the stuff that I know is true, you know, we'll just be simple about it. It was like, it became one line. And just for just, for, I'm I'm curious about this myself. What I mean, to my knowledge, you had not previously done a lot of like deep crime, uh, no. deep crime reporting, and you know, you were in Detroit like 
going to bars with ex-FBI agents. I mean, what was your, did you have a process by which you figured out how to do that stuff? Or did you just sort of say? There was a lot of, yeah, I mean, I would say, like, I consider myself a total rookie in comparison to this crowd. And uh, uh, <laughs> some heroes of mine are in the room, and I haven't told them that because, <laughs> because it's sort of not cool. But like, <laughs> this is my little secret. Um, but so there was a lot of, like, teaching myself during this. And actually, my wife is a novelist, but she went to journalism school, and she was like helping me. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was like, "So how do you do this FOIA thing?" Um, um, so, so you know. But one of the things that I learned is that I, I kind of did it because I guess Chris talked about this about doing that thing that scares you, where like this kind of story scared me because. I'm totally conflict averse. Like I did not want to end up in that adversarial reporting situation where you're trying to like pull something out of them that they don't want to say, and um, that that sort of like I guess I, one of the things I learned is like you don't have to like be a dick about it. <laughs> like I was kind of like really nice to everyone in this story. You know, they they were. Like, people want to talk about their lives. And it was a long time ago, so I had that benefit of, like, people were retired. They, they, you know, they weren't going to get um, punished, although I heard one guy didn't talk to me because he was like, what if they take away my pension? Hmm. Um, but but it, I, on the whole, people could be more free to talk to me. But um, I was surprised at what people would say, you know. <laughs> um, uh, maybe they, they regret it. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, so I, I was just kind of um, listening. And, and, you know, some of the FBI guys, they had an incentive to talk because, like, some of this was a coup for them, like the, the big protection racket when they brought down that. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I steeled myself. Like, I called fellow drug kingpins of the era in Detroit. Um, most of whom did time and are out now. Um, and like, you know, I procrastinated a week making those calls because I was so nervous. And um, they were totally happy to tell war stories <laughs> from like how much cocaine they were dealing and, yeah, and how they hid it from the cops and stuff. So that was like. Was there any fallout in Detroit? Weren't you on local news um, there? Yeah, I mean, there. It got some attention, and then like the story was was optioned for film, and that, so that you know this, um, so that like, <laughs> it's funny like that it was like that definitely increased the attention in Detroit because it was like oh there's gonna be a movie like everybody knows what that means, and um, and then like, I think it is awakened interest in like why is Rick still in prison, which is kind of the an animating question of the piece, if he, if he did all this good and was a nonviolent crime when he was 17 and he's there 27 years later, 28. Um, so, so that happened and like the local news did a five part series about it. And so actually this was something I was really hoping would happen is that some local people have like picked up the ball and gone a little bit further with it, although I'm frustrated that it hasn't gone even further. But um, I still talk to Rick on the phone from prison. Yeah, I feel like that's a funny thing about these type of magazine stories, like in contrast, uh, sharp contrast to like what Ben was talking about this morning about staying on a story and making sure that that story stays in the news and uh, even to a certain extent, like something gets done about it because you're, you continue to highlight it. Uh, in magazine writing, like so many times you, you do a story and then you sort of leave it behind and sort of uh, maybe there's some, some positive impact from it and maybe there's not, but there's not that ability to kind of like stay on the thing and like really like now what's the next step? Like what's, what's happening now? So there is a kind of like uh, get in and, and move on quality to that, that type of work. Right, right. Um, I think we'd be happy to open up for questions at this point if, if it's not too early to do that. <laughs> I was really interested in the what you were saying, Mr. Ratliff, about the um, 
multiple definitions of what constitutes narrative in j magazine journalism, and I think that's a really interesting question, both from an editor's perspective and from a writer's perspective. How the the idea of balancing the story with information, or the kind of discursive part with the candy fun, you know, rock and roll song part. Uh, so I'm wondering, if, basically, just the question is, could you both say more about how you strike that balance in your work? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, I would say we um, part of the reason that we started the Atavist to begin with was that uh, we kind of leaned in one direction on that question. Um, not that I, I don't love serious journalism, and uh, we do try to do investigative pieces. Uh, we do try to do pieces about very serious topics. I mean, this piece is, is, is very serious. Uh, but I think what I had found as a writer was that there are not very many slots in magazines for pure narrative stories, for stories that are just I mean, fun maybe like trivializes them, but uh, that are that are really just purely character driven uh, and plot driven. Uh, you know, not profiles, not not newsy. I mean, there are those stories, and uh, GQ does incredible stories like that. Esquire does incredible stories. The New Yorker, but only certain writers get to do those kind of stories. And uh, so, our idea was to actually create an outlet that was just entirely about that type of piece. Um, so. For us, we're just always pushing harder in that direction. Like we get a pitch that's pretty good. I mean, the thing we say all the time, like editors say, the most, like they'll say any bullshit to reject your pitch. Basically, <laughs> like never believe what an editor says when they reject your pitch. Because if you really dig in, it's like if someone breaks up with you. You know, like you don't want to really say like, yeah, but what's the real reason? <laughs> but I think we do say a lot, and it is actually like <laughs> mostly true. Is like this sounds like a great magazine story. Like you should do this story for a magazine. You should pitch this story to a magazine. It's just not for us. Like I could see this on the cover of the Times Magazine. Like you've really found like a topic that deserves magazine treatment, but it's not for us. There's just not enough characters in it. It just doesn't have the 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 structure won't hold for the length that we're we're talking about. So uh, I think it is. Uh, you know, it's it's not as hard as uh, you know. There are places out there that do it. So I'm not trying to claim that like we're exclusively doing it. Like we model what we do after all of these great places, and then we have sort of like the luxury of some more space that really allows us to like play out those characters a bit. So mm -hmm. I don't know what you what your view yeah, is on Yeah, yeah. No, I would say like it seems like with magazine stories there's like the two models are one that's like primarily a topic that then you find the story that's the vehicle for the topic and then there's primarily a story that you kind of hope reflects something larger than than that that narrative. Uh, and this one clearly called for the it leads with a narrative. You know, it's not like Rick is not like the poster child for any one thing. You know, it's not an obvious story about like the evils of the drug war because there are people who've been victim of worst injustice. Also, I mean, because I, he's white, it's not. A, I mean, <laughs> by virtue of him being white, it's not a very good story about the drug <laughs> the drug war. That too. That too. Um, and and so so. You know, I would say, like, just from listening to Jeff and Eric, it sounds like your story was sort of the opposite, where you, you, you knew you wanted to talk about LGBT issues in Putin's Russia, and then you found your people, um, which obviously can work. These guys beat us for the National Magazine Award. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Everyone was too polite to say, but uh, the National Magazine Award that they, they won was the one that we were also up for. They should really go after us we and were, then say, like, this is actually how you really do it if you want to like, do like, Good stuff. We were talking about running a tripwire on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone else? I have a question for each if it's okay. Um, Evan Ratliff, since um, Evan Hughes had never done a crime story, you said his pitch was just really perfect. What was it in that pitch that really convinced you that he could pull the story off? And then for Evan Hughes, when you were reporting this, you didn't have an assignment yet. And mm. so I wondered if it was a little bit difficult to get people at the FBI and stuff to talk to you, mm. since you hadn't had the story set. On the first one, I mean, it's sort of like, I don't know, it's a, like a dark art of trying to figure out, like, can someone deliver a story? I don't know if it's a dark art. <laughs> it's just an art. I mean, I'm not like doing FBI background checks on them or anything, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it varies a lot by a reporter. So obviously, like, 
for anyone, we're going to go, go read their clips. You know, we're going to go try to say, like, okay, have they done this length of work before? Have they done this in-depth reporting before? But even that, I mean, the whole idea of this, partly of this conference is sort of writers and editors. And you read a finished story, and I know from working as a fact checker, like, that story did not come in like that. And, like, it could be the editor that made it that way. And so you can never really be sure from that, even. So I think we do take a lot away from from the pitch uh, in, in this type of story where uh, you know, someone has demonstrated that they can already dig into it. And then part of the purpose of having that sort of like back and forth on the pitch itself is, is to sort of like prod at that a little bit. Because like anyone can take a story off of uh, a blog and be like, we should do a longer version of this. Like, you know, we get 10 of those a day. And so the question is like, OK, well, what do you know that no one else knows? Like, why should it be you? So in some sense, we're almost looking for like, uh, like obsession. Like I, the perfect story for us is like, the writer is so obsessed with this story that they're gonna go do it somewhere else. Like they have to do it because they're so wrapped up in it. Because that's sort of, if you're gonna deliver 18,000 words, like that's what it's gonna take uh, in order to do that. So how exactly we suss that out? I mean, we've assigned things from a whole range of like, serious career magazine writers to uh, people who are more like non-fiction uh, writers who we kind of throw some non-fiction ideas at to people who are literally straight out of journalism and it's their first assignment ever. So we've done that entire range. Stories have worked out along that entire range. Stories have failed along that entire range. So, uh, so it, it really is like, uh, you know, it's a little bit of gambling. Yeah. Um, I think when I did the early reporting, I just kind of like mumbled something about like I've written for X, Y, and Z places that proved that I wasn't like, you know, just walking in off the street. But like, I don't know if I, you know, uh, I guess I said I was talking to editors about the story, which was true, but I didn't have an assignment. And, you know, you'd be surprised, I think, in some cases, like people don't, you know, you call and say you're a journalist and you've written for X, Y, and Z, like that's enough for them that, you know, they don't have to know that. This is going to be printed in this issue of, of this prestigious magazine. Um, so fake it until you make it, basically. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely, I mean, there's certain publications that will open doors in certain ways. If you show up and say, I'm from The New Yorker, there's a certain you know, type of person who will always talk to you who might not otherwise. Right. If you say I'm from GQ, there's a certain type of person who might talk to you. There's not that type of person for the atavist. Uh, but I think uh, mostly, you know, any time you're sort of persistent with someone, they're most of the time going to talk to you. They say, OK, well, I'll look it up online. And they say, OK, this looks like a real thing. So I mean, in your case, you were doing it even just without that. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, people are usually open. How much uh, thinking uh, do you guys do in terms of trying to quantify audience for these things? Because you're so selective. On the front end, are you thinking audience? Or is it all about how good the story is? We have, I would say like we've tried to quantify audience in lots of different ways. I mean, we also, we distribute the story in a variety of ways. So we, you know, we sell the story. Um, we have subscribers. Sometimes we'll release a story for free in various conceptions. Like this story was free inside the long form app uh, for a period of time. So I would say anytime we've really tried to game for instance, sales by thinking on the front end about sales, like it, we've been wrong. Like there, ha there are some stories that we say like, this seems like it really is going to strike a chord, and it does because it's really obvious. Or like, you know, we had a story that was a kind of a love story that was also a memoir that was also about World War II. So like, just crossing all of these like genres that you sort of know like, okay, there's people who are interested in that stuff. But other times things have taken off that I really thought. We're just doing this for the love of what we do, and like we love this story, we love this writer. Let's just do it. Fuck it, no one's gonna buy it. And then like it, it was a bestseller on 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 like ebook sites. So uh, I would say we spend more time trying to like understand our our own audience and like develop that audience in certain ways, like either surveying them or like trying to see what path the story takes. That's why we try things like okay, free in the long form app. Like what does that do for us if we do that for a month? So trying to understand like where are the readers of this stuff? How do we get it to them? What is it worth to them? Like is, are there, I mean we really, to be perfectly honest, like we we're pretty open about whether or not like we, f we feel there's a real paying audience 
at the level that we do it. So that's why we experiment with a lot of things, uh, like because we're not invested in one model. So sometimes we do sell a ton of copies, but my point is more that like uh, it is sort of wide open trying to understand it. So a lot of it is just like asking a question around some story, like trying to get some answers that will then inform the next one. But in terms of assigning them, we occasionally someone will be like, no one is going to read this thing. But it's more because it sounds boring than it, than it sounds like uncommercial in some way. We do love love stories. I feel like love stories are, nonfiction love stories are really hard to find without being sappy and terrible. So like a really good nonfiction love story to me is like something we, we know we can go out and like sell. Another question? I've noticed a big theme with uh, a lot of media lately like Serial or I don't know if you've seen it, but The Jinx on HBO. I haven't seen Don't spoil it. Everyone's oh, talking about so it. So good. Um, <laughs> but the theme of like the true crime and telling stories and I just wanted to know if that motivated you at all. To, uh, to write the story or to, to publish it? Uh, well, you can answer from a writing perspective. That, that I definitely, like as we talked about, I really hadn't done a reported crime feature before this story, but it was something that I really wanted to do. And I've, like, I, I read a lot of true crime, although there's so much bad true crime, <laughs> like, especially books, you know, there's just like a dime a dozen kind of unsolved mystery type stuff that's like basically 48 hours in book form or something. There's my contempt for <laughs> the visual medium. Um, so, so um, but it was something I was interested in and I wrote this long, long piece about um, the Jeffrey McDonald murder case, which is like subject of Errol Morris's recent book and stuff. And so I, I was kind of feeling my way into that area and reading a lot. Um, <laughs> And actually now it's become a little bit of a beat, like the two stories that I'm working on now are both crime related. Mm. I would say from our perspective, uh, we do a lot of crime stories. Uh, I mean, we didn't set out to do a lot of crime stories, although I really like writing them and I really like reading them. Uh, so we always have that interest. I feel like the reason why a lot of these uh, people fall into them is that I, I actually think the thing that you're seeing is particularly if you talk about serial, is more about narrative than it is about crime. Mm. And crime is actually the reason we, I mean, we try to restrict, we'll sit down and say like, do we have too many? Because they, they're very easy narratives. Like they, they have an arc to them generally. Like someone did something, people tried to figure out if they were the ones that did it. Maybe they got caught, maybe they didn't. Uh, if they got caught, there's a natural ending to it. You know, so there's a, it's, it, those stories are much easier to find in that realm. And actually, our, our current, one of our editors works on Serial. Uh, he works part-time for us and part-time for This American Life. And I think one of the things that is going to be interesting for them is can they find a thing that's not crime? I think they're pretty determined to do something that's not crime next time. Or so I've heard. I don't have any special inside information. But, you know, because really it's about the form and, like, telling a story over that period of time. And for us, it's the same thing. We don't want to be the place that just does crime stories. We want to be a place that's... Uh, it's sort of a broad conceit. It's actually not a particularly commercial conceit, but a place that tells you know cinematic stories and narrative stories. I guess uh, kind of similar to what Ben said about the the audience, and you, you've said you've also picked stories just for the love of journalism, I guess, and kind of screw it. Um, but well, we say you, that to ourselves. Right, right, well, right, right. But uh, you know, as far as making money, are you? Is that kind of tough to make those decisions sometimes? Like, are you making money or not? I mean, how does that kind of work? Yeah, it's <laughs> a good question. I mean, it's funny because that, that is a question that I, uh, it's like I'm most commonly asked that question about, uh, about us. And I, I understand why, but I also think it's funny because like nobody asks, like magazines tank all the time. And like nobody <laughs> ever asks like, uh, like, I mean, the classic one is like, it's widely known that like Bloomberg Business Week loses like a shit ton of money every year. And they like put out a great magazine, but like if you gave me like $30 million to lose every year, like I put out also a great magazine. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's not to say it's not a good question. It is a good question. Um, and we do make money, but we have a, we have a sort of like a uh, very startup-y uh, business model, which is that uh, in addition to publishing this magazine, we have sort of two sides of our business. One of which is what we call the Atavist magazine. And the other one is Atavist the platform, which is called Creativist, which is, a software platform that people used to make like this kind of thing, or they make, you know, we do sometimes more elaborate uh, 
like this is more like a, a more video driven piece that we did. So we do them on our platform and we also like sell access to this platform to publications, to the UN, to nonprofits, to journal, journalism schools. And so we make money that way. We also make money by selling the stories, which as I said before, like sometimes really works and sometimes does not work. Uh, we make money by optioning the stories of Hollywood and sharing that money with writers. So we have all these different revenue streams. We also have investors. So like a tech startup, we're basically like, uh, we have this investment, we make this money, we're trying to make all these things match up over a long period of time. I mean, I can't go into like what all, of, like I can't go into like whether we make more money than we lose basically, but uh, I think the difference between, I think the reason that question comes up a lot is there a lot of startups, publishing startups have disappeared. Like people that we competed against at the beginning when we started, started right after us are gone. And so the, the question for us is like, do we have a plan to uh, keep doing this over five or 10 years or try to be around in 20 years? And the answer is that we do. Now like uh, <laughs> five or 10 or 20 years from now, like. Glad to hear that. Will I be? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's a good plan, <laughs> but it's a plan. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. We have five minutes now before our next event. Oh, you have a question? Hold on, one more question, one more question. Um, oh, thank you. My question is about long-form journalism at a macro level and what you feel like the future of it is and if your model is really what you think is going to stand out for marketing it to the greater audience. Uh, this is the one where I wish I'd let you impersonate me. Uh, I'm not... I'm, I preface this by saying, like, I don't, I'm not great at prognosticating about uh, the future of these uh, things. And I feel like if you looked at, like, people who prognosticated about it, like, four or five years ago, most of what they said would have turned out to be bullshit. But um, I don't think the question is whether or not, like, what we're doing is the model for this stuff existing. I think there are a lot of different models and experiments in, like, all sorts of forms, uh, and that some of those will continue to exist. And I think the thing that has been undone is the idea that uh, people pretend like no one said this, but definitely people said this, you know, seven, eight years ago that like no one, no one wanted to read stuff online. Like no one wanted to read long stuff online. Everything had to be shorter. Like that's true in a certain sense, but I think the fact that there is an audience for serious work, for engaging work, for in-depth work, for fun stories, uh, I think that that's like a given at this point and you can do it digitally and the existing magazines are doing it. Uh, you know, the magazine industry has its struggles, but uh, you look at the places that are doing this work, they're the same places that were doing this work 10 years ago and 20 years ago. So uh, I think, I'm, I guess I, what I would say is I'm not that worried about it. Like I'm worried about us succeeding and existing and doing great stories, but I don't spend a lot of time thinking like, my God, like, are we, is anyone gonna do this stuff anymore? Uh, which I think I did maybe 10 years ago. I think I really fretted about like, am I, am I entering a, a world of journalism that's like going away? And I, I really don't think that's true. Thank you.